Hello and welcome to the Oxygen Addict Podcast. We're brought to you every week by our sponsors, PrecisionFuelAndHydration.com. You can personalize your fueling and hydration strategy so you perform at your best with 15% off your first order of electrolytes and carbohydrate fuel with the code OA23 at PrecisionFuelAndHydration.com. Welcome to the show, everybody. I'm your host, Coach Rob Wilby, and every week we bring you an episode of this podcast to help motivate and inspire you. This week, we've got a fantastic interview for you with Ironman world champion, Sam Laidlow. Sam's been on the show two or three times before. He first came across my radar when he won the Lakesman back in 2019. And at the end of that um, that interview, as, as kind of a throwaway half joke, I said to him, you have to come back on the show when you're Ironman world champion. And I reminded him of this after his win in Nice, and he was true to his word and he's come back on the show today. So it's an interesting interview. He talks about everything that he's been through in the run-up to the win and the controversy as well after the win with some of the allegations of doping that were thrown out at him, as well as talking about what the win means to him, how important it's been to his family, how he sees himself progressing in the sport into the future. And it's a really good interview, I think, to demonstrate how someone who has a vision for themselves all the way from being a young child can get all the way through life and finally achieve what they've really dreamed of. So yeah, I really enjoyed this interview. I think Sam's a great guy um, and I really appreciate him taking the time to come on the show. So a couple of things you can do for us, please. If you do enjoy this episode, please follow us on Spotify or Apple Podcasts. Click like and subscribe on YouTube if you're watching on the YouTube video. And secondly, if you find this inspiring and you, you decide you want to take that step and do your first 70.3 or even your first time on the shit and you're looking for help with your training, I understand it can be difficult. I understand that it can be worrying and, and I know it's very, very challenging for people to know where to start with the training. I think we've got the best all-round system for busy age groupers who want to complete a 70.3 or an Ironman but want to keep it running alongside a busy family life, a busy working life, keep all those plates spinning at once. If you want to find out more, we've got all the details on our website, which is team.oxygenaddict.com. And if you're interested in finding out more about how coaching can work for you, just click the link in the show notes, go straight to my calendar and you can have a chat with me and we can talk you through how the process works and find out if you'd be a good fit for joining the team. So good stuff. So without further ado, I'm really proud to get onto the podcast this year's Ironman world champion, Sam Laidlow. How good does that sound, Sam? Yeah. It, uh, yeah. It feels like it's been a long time coming and, uh, yeah, it feels, feels like it's been a, certain, a long journey since, uh, that first Lakesman interview we did. So yeah, it's, uh, it's a pleasure to come back and to, yeah, to kind of, I guess I told you I would come back and you talked about me becoming world champion and stuff. So, um, it was close to my heart to come back on the show. Yeah. Oh, man, look, on a personal level, I, I really appreciate you sticking to your word and, and saying your word because it was June of 2019 when I looked back that you you came over and you raced the lakes, man. And I got a text from a mate of mine who'd won it a year or two before and he said, you're not going to believe what's happening at the lakes, man, at the moment. This this dude's shown up and he's gone 819, I think you went, or 820, didn't you? And we got you straight on the show later on that week to talk to you. And I remember one of the things you said at the end of it was, my ambition is, and always has been, I want to be the Ironman world champion. And like, fair play to you. Lots of people say that they, they, they want to do that, but very few people actually back it up. And so it's an amazing story to come from, from that, your first, your first Ironman at 20, to win in the world championships at, at 2024. So... Like yeah. from all the listeners, congratulations. That's the first thing. Yeah, thanks a lot. And um, it's funny because you said that um, you said that lots of people say it, like they say, but actually very few people do say their ambitions. You know, I think we get a bit can be a bit frightening, like taking the risk to say it out publicly, like what you really want. Uh, but generally most people that do, like yeah. They yeah, I, I generally think you can you can kind of predict what, what you're gonna achieve, um, but you just have to have the confidence to to express it and to to tell the world what you're going to do and uh yeah and now i've kind of realized that actually the bigger that goal uh the better you know because it's uh it's also quite difficult now being in a position where i'm 24 year old and, and suddenly i've achieved my lifelong goal you know so um yeah first time in my life i'm uh i was a bit lost actually uh and i wouldn't say that actually these like two or three months have been the easiest months uh, yeah. of my life actually you realize that going after something is actually way more, uh, it brings you a lot more joy than actually having it. You know? So, uh, 
yeah, the next next step is some as big a goals as I could dream of, and uh, whether I achieve them or not, we'll we'll see. But um, yeah, the goal is to win six more of these things, and I'm quite open about it. Uh, yeah, I'm, uh, I'm hopefully the greatest, but uh, yeah, we'll see. We'll see where this journey takes me. So that was my follow up question: is is the what what's next question? Is that is that what you want to do? Do you want to go and obviously a couple of people have got six of them? Do you want to do you want to go and go one better? <laughs> yeah, I mean, um, so initially, I think even in one of our podcasts, I got asked, well, like, what, what would I do if I did achieve that and stuff? And I always said that I don't, I didn't think I would go after more titles. I didn't think that was necessarily me. Uh, but then kind of taking a bit of a deeper dive into who I am and stuff after the world champs, I actually realized, that, um, I, I am a triathlete and I'm a child of the sport and I, I enjoy, uh, searching for performance and that's what brings me joy. You know, the, something that really makes me content is ending a good day of training uh, and and yeah now it's it's become it's become pretty a cool journey because i've built this small team around me we just come back from italy where we had this kind of team building uh just there's eight of us and it's and it's all part of this process and uh yes it's me performs but for me bringing this team to be the best in the world dominate that's really the goal and that's what we're striving for and uh yes yeah, it's, it's a nice prospect but, um, We'll see. Yeah, as I said, it's it's been it's it's been difficult. It's been yeah because I, I, there was straight away one of the first things I was like, okay, because four years ago I wrote that I'm going to win Kona in four years or take Nice. Now I need to write the next four years, ten years. Yeah, that's obviously what documentary was about was the kind of last four years. And, uh, so yeah, but then so the first thing I did was like, okay, I'm going to win next year, the next year, the next year, the next year, and I was like, well, well is that is that really what I want? And uh, so more than the titles now, it's it's I, I, I want the, I want my goal to, my goal in life to more be a lifestyle because that, that's something that's like you never actually pay. You know, it's something, if you just fix your goals on basically lifting a banner, uh, which is the world champs, uh, it's quite difficult when you reach it because li- the joy of lifting a banner maybe lasts a few seconds and then that evening and you enjoy it. And then the next day you're like, oh wait, was that it? Was that it? Was that everything? Like my whole life I've been gearing towards. So, uh. Now it's more about really creating a lifestyle where I, me and my team seek the best possible performance. And I just hope the titles are an outcome of that. Basically. That's really interesting. I, I wanted to come around to the documentary because I've I watched it a couple of times this week, preparing for the interview. And I want to start at the end of the documentary because it's a really interesting little bit, the last few minutes where you, it looks like you go to the attic or something and you produce this little wooden box. Will you tell us about the wooden box yeah. for the people who haven't seen yeah, the box? I can never say it's not at all staged. Like, so this, this, this wooden box is generally where my dad kept a uh, paper that four years ago when I'd moved back home, I, I kind of sat down with him and said, okay, I want to win Kona and work back from there. And I kind of took, there was, I just took an hour or two to write down everything that I thought was important to, to win. Uh, and, um, uh, yeah, you should, so I basically opened this box that I actually, I found it completely gone out of my mind. The first year I kind of kept thinking about it and we had it on a wall uh, and then we kind of put it away when COVID hit. Uh, obviously, we just kind of, we thought that everything would kind of change and for a while we didn't even know if COVID would be a thing and then um, there was no racing, etc. cetera. So uh, yeah, we put it to one side uh, and I kind of felt like, because as I said, one of my biggest goals was like when I was a, a kid, I, my parents would joke about me being becoming the youngest ever I'm at work. And as I got older, I kind of felt like it was slipping, slipping out of my hands. And I didn't think it was quite feasible. We thought maybe, maybe with the COVID, it kind of pushed everything two years back and that I might be able to win in another two years from now. Um, but yeah, all the stars aligned pretty much to a T. I, uh, I did exactly what, what wrote down on a paper. So yeah, it's, it's pretty crazy. So the piece of paper for the people who haven't seen it, you, you kind of say, right, in year one, was year one you want to complete an Ironman, or was year one I want to break eight hours for an Ironman? Yeah. It, it was a pretty lofty yeah. goal right in the off, wasn't it? Yeah. So the first the first year I wanted to go under eight hours. Uh, second year, I think either I wanted it. Yeah, either I qualified for Kona, and if I qualified, right. I want I, I wanted a podium. I didn't want to go to Kona not having the level to podium. Uh, and that again, like even last year, I didn't really think about that, but. I went to Kona just being like so overwhelmed, lucky. I felt lucky to be there and just raced and 
like honestly if i would have come nights that day i would have been over the moon you know uh, because it was just it was just cold for me and that's that had been my dream and obviously i came second there and that was like even though i'd i'd led the race most of the way uh there was i was it was just yeah i was so happy with what what had happened on that day uh and then yeah the following year which was on the paper it says that in 2023 i would win the ironman world champs uh because 23 was my dad's and my lucky number and uh yeah, so as I said, just all the stars aligned, basically. How much, how much of a home advantage did you feel with the race being in France this year? Because I've often wondered whether, I've heard, like going way back in the day, the year that um, Tim de Boom won in Kona was the year that the terrorist attacks had happened. Yeah. And, and I remember him talking about how all the way along the course, on the run course, people were shouting, go USA. There was a, a big sort of, you know, patriotic feeling, but he said, I felt they were cheering for me because there was no one else in the USA there and it lifted me and carried me through the marathon. And it's always stayed with me that I'd never considered the effect of a hometown, hometown course, but you see it in the Olympics, you saw it happen at London. How was that experience for you racing in France? Yeah, I mean, um, obviously when, when it got announced that it was in Nice, uh, originally I was like, it was difficult for me to swallow because it was as if like you'd been preparing for the Olympics your whole life and it suddenly it felt like someone just said okay well the Olympics don't exist anymore that's what it felt like to me um but then I tried to see the opportunity in, in what had happened and obviously the sack that was in France and um and then yeah Iron Man invited me to Nice in January actually to announce that the race was going to go ahead in Nice and um I remember saying in, in an interview then that I felt it would be a very important moment for the French triathlon because um until now we just had to be good basically at, at long distance and and uh, and yeah i said i believe there could be three or four french guys in the top 10 bearing in mind before my second place last year the best ever finish was like fifth place and there'd been one um so yeah and there was four there was four uh, french guys all pretty young guys in the top 10 uh and obviously we won the title so i i generally think this will inspire a lot of kids to kind of go straight to long distance uh and you see it already actually because it's, it wasn't, it just wasn't common, you know, and I think Fredino mm. and he had that influence in Germany and I reckon in not so long, we'll see a, a very dense level of younger athletes in Germany and maybe in 20 years or 15 years, this, this, this might happen in France, but, uh, yeah, as for the advantage, it, um, I guess when I first came off the bike uh, and had a six minute lead, everybody kind of knew my history and that it's kind of, it's all in, but it's all in or uh, all, all out, I guess. And, um, so they did. I don't. I didn't. They were like, of course, they were cheering, but the chances of me winning were still relatively slim. And then as the laps went on, it just got crazier and crazier. And um, I didn't realize whilst I was running on the last lap, uh, you see it a bit on the documentary and the coverage. There's like a whole swarm of, of people on scooters, bikes, everything, just following me for like the last five k, basically. Uh, but in my head, I couldn't. I couldn't even see them. You know, I mean, you're in agony. And, um, yeah, but definitely when even like the guys giving you water, you know, I think it, if they could, if there was an opportunity for them to give you like 10 milliliters more of water, they were definitely doing it, you know, uh, that's not to say they were like not giving water to the others, but uh, yeah, definitely felt a little bit of extra support. Um, and it was a, a spe special, special day because equally it's much easier to bring your friends and family to, uh, to a local race. Yeah. So when, when I man announced they were going to do the sort of rotation between Kona and Nice, I think a lot of people had the reaction you spoke of, which was like, oh, you know, this is different and it won't be the same. But having raced in Nice now, what, what are your thoughts on that regarding how that felt regarding or compared to how Kona feels? Um, yeah, I mean, if you ask me, I, I hope after these four years, we, it goes back to only being Kona. Um, I hope it's just a test or that they find some way of maintaining Kona as a, as a big event and still then, I don't know, changing the world championships. But I think Kona should still have its importance every year. Uh, yeah. And then, but yeah, I think Nice is, is a great course, uh, but it doesn't, doesn't suit me as much as Kona if, if I'm being honest. So I'm excited to go back to, to Kona and, uh, because I, I've, I've grown up and, and built my, my athletic career around that race specifically, you know, so, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll see. And, uh, I know that for instance, like yarn and stuff, they kind of, when they, when it was announced that it was a niche, they basically said, oh yeah, it's not for me. I'm too heavy and this and that, but yeah, I just, for, for what you lose for like, for me, biking is my strength 
and I'm not a climber, you know, I'm one of the heavier guys, I'm like 77 kilos. And um, so on paper, I wasn't one of the best. And same with Magnus, he's like 80, 80 plus kilos and we shouldn't be the best guys. But what you lose on the climbing, you also gain because the bike is longer, you know, we're spending four and a half hours on the bike, suddenly not four hours. So you're, you, we've equally got more time to make a difference on the weaker cyclists. Yeah. yeah. I think course uh, specifically suited uh, Patrick. And, uh, and he showed that, you know, he, he cycled very, very well. He has a very good power to weight. But, um, yeah, I believe when we get back to the, the flatter roads of, of Kona, um, Magnus and me will make even more of a difference, uh, similar to how we did it with Roth, I guess. Mm. And do you feel that the, like, obviously you grew up essentially as a cyclist on those kind of roads. There's some, let's say, challenging descents on that, that Nice course. And bike handling becomes a big part of it. And I feel as though there was a swing for a while towards, you know, just power-based cycling. The biggest number was going to win. But on the Nice course, the bike handling is definitely a big part of it as well. And it was obvious watching the video, your bike handling was was really, really good going down those hills. Did you feel as though that was going to be an advantage to you? Um, I, I, when I got asked or it already, like in interviews before the race, how I felt about the course and stuff, I kept saying that, it's not a course that suits me. It's just, I think it's a course that doesn't suit many triathletes um, and that you'd get exposed if you didn't know how to, to ride a bike basically. But I, I don't, I'm not, a, I'm not an amazing bike handler skier. I like, I'm not amazing, sorry, at handling a bike. Uh, of course I live in the Pyrenees and know how to go downhill probably better than somebody who lives in Denmark and can only go flat. But, so I kind of felt that, so I went there on camp, uh, twice before the race out of February and then again in, in the summer after Roth, uh, to, to check out the course and it was kind of it kind of got everything everybody was seemed to be overthinking it a little bit like the scent was it wasn't technical it was just very rough like the road isn't very nice so it was more about not losing your hydration not coming off the bike um and that kind of stuff so i really didn't try to take any risks i think rudy who actually lives there he he made or well, not took some risks but he went downhill faster than, than me um and, and gained probably a minute or so there but yeah, it was a risk he was willing to take and, and I, and I wasn't. And, uh, yeah. So I know that for instance, Magnus and stuff, he, he put like a dropper post on his bike and just did some crazy things. You know, I th- I really felt like people were overthinking the whole, the weight situation and the downhilling and, and all this, because at the end of the day, like you just, it's like, it's, it's not a grand tour, or like hilltop finish, you know, like power is, we're still riding at 40 K an hour around this race. And there's a lots of parts where we're at 55 km an hour. So if you've got the power and if you're aero, like and you know approximately how to go downhill, I felt you would do okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And let's talk about the reaction then afterwards among the French triathlon community, because, you know, people who don't know the French setup, you've grown up racing in the French setup. And as you said, the French haven't had an awful lot of success recently, especially at long distance. What does it feel like things have changed after your win? How's it been received amongst the, the French people and your teammates? Um, well, they obviously it's been received well, um, but uh, yeah, as I said before, like we don't have a, a rich history in I'm in the long distance triathlon, but we do have a decent history in, in short course. Uh, and just a few weeks later, Dorian Connex was world ITU champ, so that um, I mean that's that's great for the sport, but there's still a tendency like well, it's also linked because he's purely French and he has probably a French manager. I don't know, but it seems like. On the French press and stuff, they talk more about that and there's documentaries and stuff. But I mean, I, I obviously have like half my following is French and half is international, I would say. So I, I, I also like do most of my interviews and stuff in English. So I'm happy to, to leave it that way. And slowly we might push, as I said, I, my manager is not French. So it depends a lot on these, kind. Of, it, it depends a lot on these kind of things. Um, yeah, but the, I think, yeah, I, I think it's more of a slow process, you know, and it needs to become like, it, it, yeah, it need, it's the same with with anything you know with if if one guy like one french guy wins in a a formula one it's not like suddenly everybody's watching formula one in france it takes it takes a certain heritage and that heritage is built up over over years and years and years so yeah that's what germany did uh with with their rich history in ironman and uh yeah in fact it was quite i went to the selfish night in, in december which is uh i didn't really realize i just thought it was a night like an evening put on by sailfish, but it turns out it's actually much more like a like the German like the German awards basically for triathlon. Uh, yeah, you really you really notice what a big 
like there was like 700 people just like fans of the sport just came to basically see who would get the prize and stuff and uh yeah all sat down at dinner and it's yeah i, I hope that we can go towards that um because i believe that it's uh it's a cool sport and uh the goal is to make it cooler you know like it can be boring to watch i agree uh, and sometimes some of the race organizers uh don't necessarily make it exciting to watch i believe you know when you watch a uh, a press conference in Ironman or in any kind of other triathlon, like most of the time, you just want to go to sleep. So trying to make it a bit more exciting. Um, definitely the PTO are trying to do that. Like we're kind of building characters and stories. Um, but equally, it's it's on the athletes uh, themselves where you have to kind of do some work. You know, if that's what you're winning, like if you want to, if you want to elevate the sport, there needs to be characters and heroes. Uh, and sometimes to do that, you have to kind of caricature athletes a tiny bit you know i'm not saying change them or put on a persona but i'm just saying yeah caricature them very slightly yeah okay i wanted to ask you about the lead into nice this year because and the documentary covers this really well after your second place in kona in october it wasn't exactly the smoothest run-in for you was it leading into nice this year so so talk us through a little bit the challenges that you had coming in with you know, with Lanzarote and then with Singapore and, and all of that stuff. Because I think that it's a very interesting journey you went on to even get to the start line. Yeah, I mean, first of all, like we need to take it back a little bit to Kona because obviously in Kona, I really went from being like nobody to suddenly everybody know my name in triathlon. Um, and, and, I, and I signed with like the biggest brands in the sport uh, before ever even winning professional race, you know. So I was in a very rare situation and... Uh, uh, so of course there was a built up pressure, uh, from me and also from just natural from fans and partners. Uh, and so, yeah, I definitely felt a lot of pressure to really perform. And I felt like, okay, this is the year where I had to deliver, you know, uh, because as I said, I've got people investing in you, uh, and yeah, I felt like I need to perform. And so I trained really, really well, actually over the winter, I actually felt like I'd almost discovered a, a new gear from the confidence I got from Kona. And so I'd done probably the best like four or five months over the winter I'd ever done. And, uh, and I was, went into the season happy with what I'd done, not necessarily confident, but happy because I felt like I had stepped up a gear and, um, yeah. So it started in Gran Canaria, uh, with half, I'm not really being my speciality, but the level was decent there and I, and I won the race. So that was a good start. And around that time was actually, um, uh, I think there was three weeks to Lanzarote. So then I went straight to Lanzarote or something, four weeks maybe. And, uh, and around that time was where I had my best, that was peak of my, uh, physical capabilities of this year, really, uh, generally, I don't know, maybe some athletes might disagree, but I find it's quite difficult once you hit the season to kind of elevate your level again, unless you kind of come away from the racing and like do a proper two month block, you know? Uh, so because there's always traveling and then racing, traveling, recovering, et cetera. So, um, yeah, lean into Lanzarote. That's when I, I felt I was at my peak. Um, and I, uh, like on paper, it looked impossible to lose Lanzarote. You know, I, we thought that my dad and I thought that like I could cruise win with 10 minute lead. That's what we thought. And, um, but yeah, um, you can't be, uh, you can't be overconfident in this sport. And, uh, I just, yeah, I was started feeling not too great two or three days before and, uh, I did some, some blood work there in Lanzarote, um, uh, which actually cost me an arm and leg. So I don't recommend anybody doing any kind of lab or COVID test or anything in Lanzarote. Uh, and, uh, yeah, I found out that I had a liver infection, uh, which we don't really know what was caused by. It could be bad food. It could be lake water. It could be anything. Um, and, uh, yeah, so I, I, yeah, I felt okay for an hour on the bike. Um, then just no energy I kind of hobbled ground until finished at bike. Um, but obviously I'd set off at the power I wanted to. So I did an hour, like where, where we thought I'd be. And then I like, suddenly just was completely empty, but you start, you start anyway, I ended up DNF in that race after 20 K of a run. Um, and from the outside, everybody was like, oh, he's, he's overpacing here. Like he's just trying, trying, like he's trying to bat above his station basically, but deep down I knew, I knew I was capable of that kind of wattage on the bike and that kind of pace running and, um. And even when I look back at that now, when that's, that's when I believe I had my best like shape of the year, best run shape specifically. And I, I, I just two and a half hours of the bike, I've basically been like, 
Dubai. And then I came off of, okay, I'm going to start a marathon, see where this leads me. And I ran myself back into the lead and was like running a, uh, like 339, 340 minute kilometer pace for the first 20 K and then the lights just completely went out again. So somewhere like I kind of knew that there was like good shape in me, but of course you, you start having doubts. You're like, oh, because but before that I'd only, I'd only performed well over the Ironman distance in Kona. No other race had I not blown up pretty much. Um, and, uh, so yeah, it was the step, the doubt start running again. And it took me like two, two and a bit weeks to get over that liver infection because it's just, um, you can't really absorb carbs like how you do and kind of have to flush your system out. And it's, it's just takes time and it's, it's difficult. It's not like a physical injury. So you're like, surely I can train. And so I'd keep going training and make it worse and et cetera. So, and then suddenly I only had like two or three weeks left before Roth. Um, and Roth was, was another main goal, of course, then I arrived in Roth healthy, but I was just not trained. Um, so we went some crazy speeds on, on the, on the bike with Magnus, uh, had like a 12 minute lead over third place. And then on the run after only like 10 K already, my calf just pinged basically because I, I wasn't trained enough, you know, and suddenly I'd just ridden a world record pace pretty much for 180 K and started running at. 345 minute kilometers pace. And so, yeah, something just said stop. Um, but I felt so bad from, from Lanzarote that I felt the kind of pressure to, to finish, I guess. And, um, so yeah, I, I, I kind of hobbled my way around 30 K, uh, but yeah, finished. And I, I think I ran 305 marathon, but still did like seven, I can't remember what time I did, but 740, I can't remember. It's like it was, it was pretty, no, I can't remember what time it was, but it's pretty insane time considering I ran a 305 marathon. Would you like to go back to Roth when you're healthy and, and in shape? Was a, a pretty amazing experience? Yeah, yeah. I mean, for sure. It's it's crazy. Even like, the, obviously, it's a very small town and all the pros kind of stay at home stays. And over there, like, Jan Fredino is like David Beckham, you know, he's like, it's, it's, it's insane. Uh, like, everybody's just in love with Drass on there. Um, so, yeah, of course, I'd like to go back, sit healthy, and again, have a good battle with Magnus there. I, I believe, um, Roth is kind of his thing and that he'll be very good there for, for a few years. Uh, of course. Yeah. I, that's definitely a bucket list race. Yeah. Uh, so then after Roth, it was kind of took me again, three weeks, I guess, of no running, uh, to get over my, my calf, uh, tear. It was a very small tear. So it was, it was okay. Um, uh, and so then slowly built back up again, um, went to, uh, challenged London, uh, just as a kind of training race. And I had some error testing to do in the UK anyway. And then, then from there could kind of see the trajectory going back up. And I thought, okay, maybe I could save something. Because when I had this calf tail, I was like, oh, well, this is it done. You know, like I can do the race, but I'm not, I'm not going to win it. Um, but I could see it kind of upward trajectory and it was kind of back in my mind. I was like, okay, well maybe actually I could actually, this could bring me some freshness and I could be in decent shape and maybe I can save a podium again, you know, in this, uh, so build back up because I had not raced on the PTO circuit the whole year. I was like, I felt quite fit. Training was going well. And we kind of made a last minute decision to go to Singapore. Um, and, uh, on the way there, the flight was like delayed by pretty much 24 hours. So I, I it took me like two days to get there. Uh, so two days, no training. I got there, trained for one day, like inside, then got COVID, got really ill. Um, and so basically like tried to start the race, just wasn't in it. I was cramping already in the swim. Um, and, um, yeah, at that point I was in like such a dark place, I guess, but I felt like I just completely messed up the season. Um, that, uh, that evening I just went on the piss. Uh, really? Yeah. Yeah. Like really, really hardcore with everybody else. Like not knowing that I had COVID obviously otherwise. Yeah. Um, uh, but everybody, I don't know, some, like there was this stomach bug going around. There was just general sickness and then there was COVID. So I don't know if I had all three or, or one of them or so but anyway, uh, and I didn't test positive for, for COVID, you know, it was just, uh, it was just me. I was just vomiting and I, so I thought it was a stomach bug, you know, but anyway, um, and so, yeah, I went, uh, yeah, I went on the piss, I <laughs> drank a bit too heavily. And I remember the next morning having breakfast with Gustav at a hotel who'd also had a bad race and, uh, and a difficult year. And, um, we were just kind of both like, yeah, just basically uh expressed how we felt to each other you know uh, and and uh at one point he asked me how i felt about nice and i basically just 
I'd given up on it, you know, pretty much given up on it. Uh, but I, I believe everything that happened up until then was looking about to test me. Uh, and, uh, and they kind of, in the end, if I overcame everything, um, I'd be all right. So then anyway, I flew straight from Singapore to Nice. And then I, I was like in a, in a bubble basically for three weeks, uh, just with my, my coach, my dad and, um, and after my training partner who came sixth and, uh, the three weeks went really well. Um, I did two or three, like really decent sessions where, where again, we thought, we thought actually maybe I could do something. Uh, but it was, it, we honestly, well, I didn't believe I could win. You know, it, although when you look at, when I watched the documentary, so one of the last runs I did with after top before the race, I was like, oh, you know, like if I do a top eight, I'd be happy. And I was like, come on, top eight in the world is good. And he was just, oh, just shut up. And so he could see the numbers and stuff that I was doing. And then now when I see the interviews of like everybody else around, like my dad, my mom, in the documentary, it looks like they, they filmed the day after they, they were so confident I was going to win, you know, and I didn't at all. I felt so far away from that, you know? So, uh, yeah, it was, it was fascinating to see that and to, to realize that actually it's the, it's the confidence that your team have around you that actually like get you to places. Yeah. That's interesting you say that because I did assume that that stuff was filmed after the race and the fact that it was filmed before the race, they, they had no doubts at all yes. that you were going to, that you were going to perform at the very least and probably win. Right. Yeah. I mean, my mum, my mum was saying things like, oh, so I think Sam needs to remember that he's got wings and that sometimes it's time to fly. And then just, there was so many, I said on that day, so many stars aligned. My dad said, similarly, he said that he thinks I can win. And, but yeah, I, I felt so far away from it, but, um. Yeah, yeah it's, it's always when you least expect it, you know, and just, you never know, you know, maybe if you just carry on working, whatever it is, not just draft, or if you just carry on working, you never know what, what could happen tomorrow. So, uh, yeah. And what was their reaction? Your mum, your dad, your brother, your girlfriend, I know you were very, you were a very close knit unit and that really comes across in the documentary, how it feels as though all of you won. It feels as though it was a genuine family, you know, you, you express it really well when you say it's been our dream since I was five years old for me to win this they're all part of it with you the whole way it really comes across in the film yeah and um yeah it's it's, it's pretty it's pretty i feel so grateful basically because it's um they've yeah they've they my but my parents were both very accomplished people in their own rights and then they invested everything into not necessarily um creating a world champion just invested everything into having a stable and loving family, you know, and they invested so much, they invested the whole life into that. Um, and really for me, my profound motivation, like the world title for me was to give back to them, you know, of course, mm -hmm. like you can, you can give your parents back money or buy them a house or this or that, but realistically they're just seeing, this is like something that they'll take to their grave, you know, their emotions that we give them that day. Uh, yeah. So it's, um, and also I believe that like, I'm just an athlete and I'm, 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 I'm not, I don't believe really in, in being overly talented. Um, or I think maybe, it's, maybe I do that's a lie, but when you get to a high level in a sport, uh, everybody, everybody's talented, you know, everybody trains hard. And so the only thing that separates like the first place from the second place from the third place, uh, other things, and especially the team, you know, and I have, and I, I believe, and I am creating the best team around me. Um, uh, and that when people ask me what my strength is. That really is my strength. You know, I, my strength is bringing amazing people around the table and to motivate them on, on, on a singular project, uh, more so than whatever my strength endurance or my FTP or this or that. Yeah. There's a great bit at the end of the documentary where your brother, Jake, your younger brother says, well, I've got, I can't remember what it is. I've, I've got six years or something to, to win the world championships now to do it younger than he was. And I just think. There's that scene and there's a scene where you're standing at the side of the road, cheering on the little kids at one of Jake's race and clapping them and as it goes by. And I sort of think that's ultimately what this is all about. It's not, it's not about numbers on a page. It's about inspiring the next little generation of kids coming through to do the same thing that you've been inspired to do. Yeah, for sure. And it's quite, it's quite a difficult, I've asked myself this question quite a lot recently. So I feel in a slight dilemma because, uh, on the one hand, like kids they want to do football right because they see ronaldo driving a ferrari and with a with a really expensive watch on his wrist and, and that's not what cristiano ronaldo is about you know that's an image he's giving and he's and it's kind and it seems quite when you see that 
it looks quite selfish, you know, and so you could, I could have bought it with the same mentality as, okay, I'm going to make this sport cool. I'm going to make kids want to do triathlon because they know they can buy an Aston Martin if they win Kona or this or that or that. Um, but you, funny, it's, it's not actually a self, it's, it's almost selfless because you're basically exposing your life uh, and everything you do to kind of inspire and be a hero. So it's, it's, it's a very weird situation and, and, I'm, and I'm, I'm not saying I'm at all there, but at the moment I feel like I'm like, I don't know which direction to go in. If I should just kind of keep, keep calm and quiet and enjoy my simple life. Uh, and in which case I might just go and I might win a world title or two more, et cetera, but I'll, I'll just go unnoticed, you know, I'll enjoy my life, but I might go unnoticed or I take all these risks and I, and I pursue my wildest dreams and kind of not show off, but just like really live my life to the fullest and show what, what, what you can achieve through triathlon because that's at the end of the day that is what what inspires kids you know so it's um yeah it's it's a general a, a general, general question that i've i've been asking myself and that i'm it's the next step in me trying to find myself and where I, where i bring my career yeah it sounds like you, you're going through that cycle a little bit of you've aimed for this thing for literally your whole life and now you've achieved it it's the it's the what's next which which fork in the road do i take mm, yeah yeah for sure, yeah. But I think for, for the first step of doing that is really to identify like who I am and what makes me happy because it's very you can very quickly get lost and and I had a and I had a period like that where after after the world champs after living such a high, uh, I kind of noticed that for two for two months so it's been what three and a bit months and for two and a bit months my my mental health was going like down and I was just not being a nice person. Um, and I, I kind of expected a low after the, such a high, but in a different way, you know, and the, the low for me came more from as a, yeah, I, I think when you're at the top, obviously everybody's, oh, you're, you're amazing. It's amazing what you've done. And it, it's not a natural, it's not a natural, uh, how to say it. Yeah. It's, it's, it's not natural for a human to get that many praise. I, I don't believe. And, um, and this is why like mega celebrities, like like have these drug addictions or whatever sometimes commit suicide and obviously at a much much lower scale but you could feel a start of that where my ego just got too too big uh and i wasn't i wasn't respecting any more the people that were around me my, my my original team you know uh because at the end of the day they're the people who 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 love me uh it's not the it's not the fans or or the or the sponsors you know the people who love me uh the, you can count them on, on on a hand or two you know so um yeah, it's, uh, it took me, it took me a while to realize that. And I, and I did, I, I, I hit some, some pretty dark places. Yeah. I'm not, not shy away. And I, I want to ask you at this point, and this is a potentially a, a delicate subject, something that might have played into this was in the immediate aftermath of Kona, there were some pretty serious allegations of drug use leveled at you on, on social media and in other places as well. Can you talk us through your reaction to that? Yeah, I mean, obviously, this was a big, a big factor as well. And it, I think you said after Kona, but it's been after Nice. Uh, after, I'm sorry, after yeah, Nice. Yeah, um, yeah, it's been that that really didn't help, and the way it felt for me, uh, or the way I could describe it to people, is that I felt like for 15 years of my life, or pretty much my whole life, I'd been trying to build this like amazing villa, let's say, you know, and that like literally. Not even a month later, like the next day, pretty much, I build this filler. Somebody just comes and like breaks it all. You know, that's what it felt like. Just and that's what's what's sad about it is that this is literally created from nothing or a few a few comments. You know, and um, and often it's generated by by jealousy. And but some people, there's some people in the world in the world that just I don't know. I think they feed off negative energy or or, or something or conflict. And, uh, by the end of the day, I can't, I've come to realize that I can't control other people's opinion on me. You know? I know, I know who I am and I'll carry on doing what I'm doing. And, uh, and yeah, but it's, it's, it's a horrible, it's a horrible situation and I don't wish it on anybody. And the reason, the, re the reason I reacted how I did, uh, because I, again, that was like people, people, I, it felt like people thought that I brought it to light, but the reason I brought it to light was because there's been, there's been many Ironman world champions before me. And pretty much all of them have had to do with some sort of allegations. It just goes unnoticed, you know, or, or not only the people in the community know it, but when you're the athlete, it is, it's really difficult. You know? uh, and so I was like, well, these people are just accusing people freely, 
they should be they should be punished just the same as the guy who cheats, basically. Um, and so I, I, I didn't really care about exposing it because I, that's what I wanted to stop. I wanted there to be a system in place where you can't just, it's too easy. You know, I could go to a race, go to the world championship next year and the day before the race or two days before the race saying, oh yeah, uh, Gustav is taking this, that, and that. And that will affect his mental state like crazy. So it's, it's just, I think people need to be a bit more careful about how, how freely we kind of express anything or rumors or because at the end of the day, like we're not doing anything crazy, you know, you and many people can run at 350, 350 per kilometer. Uh, it's just how long can you hold it for? And many people, you can, you can, you can do a hundred, you can do a hundred meters at three minutes, 50, yeah, maybe, maybe 50 meters, 50 meters. Exactly. So all, all you need now is just to increase your aerobic capacity to do it for longer. And it's the same on the bike. Everybody can sprint up over 200 watts. It's just who can maintain it long. So I don't believe we're doing like these crazy inhumane things, you know, uh, I grew up believing that like I, I'd never very early on, I got an opportunity to race like the best, whether it's Gomez, Brownlee, um, Fredino, and I never like looked at them. I thought, Jesus, like that's seems inhumane what they're doing, you know? And I just, so I grew up with that belief that I could be better. And I, and I believe the people who are accusing me don't believe that. And so I, so, I, and I've always said that I don't believe the, the true greats are cheats because you don't have that kind of mentality. You, know, you don't have the mentality of looking for shortcuts. Um, and at the end of the day, the people who are accusing me, um, and they are other pros that have, I don't know, they've either taken, they've listened to some random guy on the internet or whatever. Um, they're kind of hiding behind that because deep down, they know that they're not going to be the best in the world. And I can't do anything about that. I can't control that. And, um, yeah, that was obviously difficult to swallow and it kind of, it, it was, it wasn't, it wasn't even about me. I just, it just felt so saddening for my family and, and my team, you know, because it's, it's, we've worked so hard for this and, uh, for me to get a few like negative comments for it to explode like that. So yeah, anyway, um, that's, the, that's the situation. Yeah. Can you understand why people are suspicious given things that have happened in cycling? Can you understand why the, the general public kind of look at this and go, well, hang on this, you know. Sam's effectively come from nowhere to win this. There must be something suspicious going on. What would your yeah, reaction to that be? I genuinely believe the cycling days, obviously the, the yeah, the early 2000s and all that didn't help. Um, and then the case last year was like a real shock and a wake up call with Colin's case. And, um, and in, in some, in some senses, or me personally, I'm really happy that the Colin case happened because we've been tested like way, way more. Yeah, how often do you how often do you get tested as a pro? Um, I've been tested eight. I got my Adams file open next to me because we have to put the the whereabouts like over fifteen times this year. Um, really? And it's and pe people don't realize like it's yeah. it's, a lot of, it's a lot of time and, and energy. It's every single day you have to basically devote an hour of your life to being in a certain place and and not not forgetting to be there. You know so. There's been times where I've just like, I've oh, gone out to a restaurant to watch a rugby, like rugby match with my mates and, and you get called and you can't go because, and, and, and so right. when people just accuse you and you're like, like, yeah, devoting your, you're, you're devoting your life to also showing that you're clean and being but equally, you don't want to, I don't want to be like, it looks even more suspicious, you know, if I'm there and I'm saying, and I'm like, oh, well, here's my Adams. Look, I've never tested. And I could do this, you know, we could, I could contact whatever water and show that there's never been any, not even variation in my blood work. So. And there was an email going around by, by Rudy Stav, which was just, it was just insane. Like he's just making things up out of thin air. And so, yeah, it's, yeah, he's had his, he's had problems in the past and, um, and all my partners uh, are on my side, you know, cause that was the big risk when I exposed it, it was like, oh, maybe people saying, oh, I might lose sponsors, it doesn't look good, et cetera. But it wasn't about me. It was about people just being a bit more careful. Now I don't want the next world champion to be accused of doping when he's worked his whole life, you know, to achieve. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, good. Well, thank you for answering those questions. So honestly, I really appreciate that. And I think a lot of people who are fans of the sport will appreciate it as well. On a happier note, I want to wrap this up with a couple of questions we've got for listeners, or from listeners for you. So first up, Jason H says, how do you gauge how hard you go on the bike? Is there a limit you set yourself or do you just go all guns out? Um, so I, I work a lot on heart rate during Ironman. Pretty much my whole race, I or maybe apart from the start of the swim, I try and keep around 150 BPM 
my max is maybe around 185, if that gives a kind of perspective. Um, and so yeah, most of the time I try to aim for that, but then there's key moments in the race where you have to attack. And so I'm sure my heart rate, when, when Clement attacked on the first climb, uh, it was probably over 170, you know, and you have to take these risks. Um, and yeah, the, the main thing is probably not spending four or five minutes over your threshold, uh, because then like you might not have enough like blood to your stomach and then nutrition might go wrong, etc. So you can kind of put short bursts in, but, um, I would say if you're an age grouper, um, yeah, trying to fix or use your previous Ironmans as an example, um, of kind of what your average heart rate is, uh, across the bike and across the run and just try and aim, aim for that basically. And sometimes after the swim, after the run in transition, it can take a bit of time to, to come back down. Uh, but generally after 10 or 15 K or so you should, yeah, I guess aim for, aim for that heart rate or that's what I do in this. Nice. Uh, Dave B says, what was Sam's average power climbing the Col Decra? So there you go. That's put you on the spot. He wants actual yeah. numbers, Sam. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, because he sent me the questions before I checked and it was around 370, 380, uh, yeah, for uh, close to an hour. It depends where you count the Col Decra from because it starts pretty much down from the bottom all the way to the top. Yeah. yeah. 380 watts. Nice one. Uh, and finally, Stephen C says, have you got any tips for the Nice Ironman course? I'm doing it later this year. Please help. Um, I would say it's, um, yeah, to, to not, unlike I did not get too excited on the, on the first climb, uh, um, because it's, it's a much longer bike course, you know, either it's, it's like 25 minutes more for me, but obviously that time is exponential with you're spending more time on course. So it could be 50 minutes or an hour more, but for some people, um, and there isn't that many aid stations compared to some Ironman. So making sure you don't lose your bottles, uh, keeping hydrated because also when it's technical and, and you're kind of looking at the road, et cetera, you don't think about hydration. So I would say, yeah, making sure you hit all the aid stations and kind of putting on your Garmin or on a bit of paper on your bike, like when to take the nutrition and just being religious about it. Um, and then, yeah, the run is pretty, the run is pretty straightforward. There's lots of aid stations and, um, but it's, it's very mentally difficult because it's, it's just out and back uh, and it feels like a, a straight line that goes on forever. So, uh, be prepared mentally for the run. Yeah. I found that really hard when you turn around at the airport and you can see the dome on top of the casino at the, yeah. at the line and it looks like it's the end of the earth, doesn't it? It's only 5k yeah. away, but yeah. And it, it can, and it can be very hot as well. If he's, if he's racing in July, uh, or was it not June, July? Or, yeah. Um, it can, it can, especially on the promenade, it can feel like 40 degrees there. Yeah. Great. Hey, well, listen, just to wrap this up then, what's the plan for the rest of the year for you? Looking, looking forward into the rest of this racing year. The rest of the year, just Christmas and, uh, yeah, Christmas and a bit of training. Now, uh, next year, um, it's been, it's been difficult because, um, well, it's, it's a good position to be in, but all the, all the, um, all the different, I'd say, all the different brands that I'm and PTO and challenge all investing more uh, into the athletes, which is good to see. Uh, but as I said, there's more and more money in the sport and it can be difficult to do everything. There's so many races now. Um, so for me, my, my goal is obviously still Kona. Uh, and then around that, it's, it's still not sure because um, the PTO are putting in place like a system where they pay their athletes to race uh, a certain amount of races, et cetera. Like kind of like a contract, um, and Ironman is Ironman. Don't do that, but you, you might you might think, okay, I'm going to chase the Ironman uh, Pro Series. So, yeah, still a lot of a lot of uh, questions. Um, but ideally, I'd like to race everywhere. But you need to. At the end, I, the way I look at it is, okay, I've got 315 days or something to Kona, and uh, what am I going to do to to be the best possible shape there? And whatever races uh, will happen before that. Um, I'll, I'll let people know on my lovely website, <laughs> the old friend made for me. Last question, going at flat out and if everything went perfectly on a course like Roth, how fast do you think you could go? Uh, over the whole distance. Uh, uh, see, see, it's a good question. The, th the thing is Roth, have you raced Roth? No. It's, it's really not flat. Like it's, it's incredible no. how fast we go on the bike, considering it's actually like really hard and always on and off the power. Um, 
So, uh, and, and the run is slightly short there. So it depends how you measure it. Um, I believe, I'm sorry, I'm going to completely not answer your question. I believe it's possible to ride under four hours in Kona and I, and I, and I, and I want to do that. Uh, and, um, yeah, Nice, uh, sorry, Roth, uh, I think, I guess in an optimal situation, you could swim 46, let's say 46, 30 or something. So I'm going to, I'm going to get my calculator out. 46 plus, let's say 355. So that's, uh, that's, uh, plus a marathon in two hours, 35. So I, my dad and me still believe that we've got, I've got more, uh, I can improve more on my cycling than like the Norwegian philosophies. They believe they can like run 225, you know, and gain like five to 10 minutes there. My dad and me believe I can do that more on the bike and carry on kind of slowly progressing on the run. Uh, so yeah, I, I, I believe 235 in an in optimal world. So that would be, uh, 216. That'd be 715. It's about that's, around mark. That'd be 426 minutes. So that's the wise 426 minutes. The wise by 60 is 7.1 so that's like yeah seven that's that's really really fast 706 isn't it <laughs> Forget that. i don't think <laughs> no six no yeah 706 yeah no yeah. i what, what what did magnus do in ross 724 or 728 24 i think yeah i mean i i think magnus can magnus and me on a good day could go on that but i want to see i want to see you and magnus on the bike out the swim together on the bike together and then a foot race at Roth. No, no, no. That's, that's the last time I'm coming out of the swim with Magnus. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Love it. Listen, Sam, thank you very much for your time on the interview today. And congratulations again. I'd encourage everyone listening to go and watch your documentary, which is on YouTube and it's titled Look, Mum, I Can Fly. That's the one, yeah. But then later I realized that Travis Scott, the singer, has the same documentary called Look, Mum, I Can Fly. Um, but it's look mum, like M O M and I, and yeah, mine's M U M just if people can't find it. And tell us your, your website and your Instagram so people can go and check out more about you. Um, yeah. Website is Sam Laidlow and Instagram is also, also Sam Laidlow. So pretty easy. Well, listen, thanks very much for being true to your word. And, uh, back in 2019, you said. When I'm Ironman world champion, I'll come back on and, and here we are. So on behalf of me and all the listeners, congratulations. We look forward to watching what evolves over the next two decades. Thanks a lot, mate. Appreciate it. Well, I hope you really enjoyed that interview with Sam Laidlow there. I think he was good to his word. He came on, he was honest. He didn't dodge the difficult questions. I'd sat down with him beforehand and said, look, I really want to address some of these allegations that have been put towards you. And let's address him. And he, and he was fully up for it right from the start. So full credit to him. And uh, yeah, I hope you gained a lot from listening to that interview overall. So to wrap this up, here are some discount codes and deals for you. At precisionfuelandhydration.com, you can use the code OA23 for 15% off your first electrolyte order. And you can head to their website. You can use the free fuel and hydration planning tool to receive a personalized strategy for your next race. You heard Sam there talking about the importance of in his case, racing Ironman Nice, planning your hydration and planning your calories, planning where you're going to take them. The first part of that is knowing how much sodium, how much fluid and how many grams of carbs you can have per hour and that you tolerate. So the fuel and hydration planning tool over on the PFNH website is the first stop for that. That'll really help you understand what's right for you, your body, the conditions you're racing in or the conditions you're training in and the events that you want to do. So basically you can refine your strategy in training and then you can deliver it on race day. You can also book a free one-to-one -one video consultation with PFNH's athlete support team, and they'll be happy to help you nail your race nutrition plan and then perform your best on race day. And remember over at teamoxygenetic.com, I think we've got the most comprehensive endurance sports coaching program for busy age groupers. If you've been a, a long-term listener of the show and you've been sitting there for a while thinking, do you know what? I really think I could do it excuse me, do some help with my training and really get some coaching going into the next season. Now is the perfect time as we're starting a new season. It's the perfect time to explore coaching and find out the difference that it can make for you. The one big difference that I think we make to athletes with our coaching is we take away the worry of the training 
on a day-to-day basis. You no longer have to think what you're going to do on a day-to-day basis or worry that what you're doing is right or not, or wonder whether you should be doing a different kind of training session. The one thing that I offer, if I had to sum it up, is we take away that doubt from an athlete's mind and allow you just to concentrate on the business of getting your training session done and then get back to your family life, your work life, your hobbies, and it's all taken care of. And if you can get the training done that we set you, guarantee you'll be in excellent shape for whichever race you choose to enter. So if you want to find out more, click a link in the show notes and we'll have a chat with you and we can just go from there. All right then. So remember, there's links in the show notes on YouTube or on podcast player of your choice. You don't have to remember them. Just go through and click and it goes right through to our calendar or it goes right through to PFNH. And until next week, have a great safe training racing week. I'm coach Rob Wilby and you've been listening to the Oxygen Addict Podcast. <laughs>